I come from a family of foodies. We're constantly going out to restaurants, making these new recipes that you've never heard of and sound really strange until you actually eat them and they taste really good. Um, and our trips were always food centered and honestly, I just lived for food. Um, so you can imagine how hard it was when I was 14 years old and everything I ate began to really hurt my stomach. And it got progressively worse until I was 19 and was officially diagnosed with gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is characterized by delayed gastric emptying, which means that after you eat food, it takes a longer than normal time to actually move the food from your stomach into your small intestines. About 5 million Americans suffer from gastroparesis, and the majority of them suffer due to diabetes. However, there are other causes as well, such as autoimmune diseases like lupus, you could have multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, there's also heritable connective tissue diseases such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is the cause of my gastroparesis. Um, and honestly, a huge chunk of people with gastroparesis have idiopathic gastroparesis, which means that they do not know the cause of their gastroparesis. And as you can hear from the word, gastroparesis literally translates to paralyzed stomach. So that basically explains why somebody with gastroparesis has symptoms such as struggling to eat, constant nausea, really bad pain every single time they eat in their stomach, bloating, and just the inability to really eat much at all. So let's imagine that you've just eaten, I don't know, say a big plate of french fries, because why not? Um, and your stomach is going to send signals to your brain to tell it how much you just ate, the level of nutrients in that food, and your brain's also gonna send signals back to your stomach through the vagus nerve to help the stomach contract and move that food along. Now, a normal stomach moves between one and four calories of food from the stomach into the small intestine. And this pace of movement of food is really monitored and regulated by two different things, hormonal mechanisms and neural mechanisms. So somebody with gastroparesis typically has a neuroelectrical dysfunction, and typically it's referring to the vagus nerve, which is this really long nerve that runs all the way down your digestive tract and really plays a huge role in digestion. So if somebody has a damaged vagus nerve, let's say you eat that plate of french fries again, and your brain is trying to send signals through your vagus nerve to contract your stomach, but the vagus nerve is damaged, the contractions are not going to be as strong and they're not going to be as frequent, and that person is going to have issues digesting that food. So after you've eaten, your body also releases certain satiety hormones, such as glucagon-like peptide 1 or GLP-1, to signal to you that you can stop eating. And what this does is it delays gastric emptying, it prevents you from being hungry so you feel very satisfied, and you know that you can stop eating now. Seeing as GLP-1 slows gastric emptying and decreases your appetite, you can imagine that you'd want that, those levels to be pretty low in somebody with gastroparesis, since they already have slow gastric emptying and a little appetite. So there's one medication that's a GLP-1 receptor antagonist. It basically blocks the GLP-1 receptors so that they can't bind to it and GLP-1 will not be working. So it sounds like it'd be a good treatment option for somebody with gastroparesis. However, there are other factors to take into account. So there's one study that shows that a GLP receptor antagonist is not a good option for somebody with gastroparesis. Um, and the reason they suggest this is that after a vagotomy in rats, which is where they removed part of the vagus nerve, the other portions, or the, actually the other functions of GLP-1, such as gastric acid secretion, didn't really occur. And so it basically proved that in order for GLP-1 to really work efficiently, you need to have an intact vagus nerve. But that's problematic because somebody with gastroparesis typically does not have an intact vagus nerve. So therefore, even if we were to use a GLP-1 receptor antagonist, like Extended 939, it probably would not be the best medication for somebody with gastroparesis because they would not have an intact vagus nerve to actually use GLP-1 and make it work. So let's say it's been some time since your last meal of french fries and your body has almost digested them completely. Now your body's going to release two different types of hormones that I'm going to focus on today that basically increase your hunger levels and say, hey, it's time to eat again. One of those is ghrelin. It's considered an anticipatory hormone because it anticipates basically your next meal. 
Your body recognizes that you're fasting and so it increases ghrelin levels which make you hungry and it also speeds up gastric emptying. So a study has actually found that ghrelin levels in gastroparesis patients are lower than regular people. And that's interesting because ghrelin levels increase appetite and people with gastroparesis tend to have low appetites. So there's actually a medication called TZP-101, which is a ghrelin receptor agonist, um, not to be confused with antagonist, um, and it can actually increase appetite and reduce nausea in people with gastroparesis. So an agonist is kind of like the opposite of an antagonist. And so for this case, you have a medication that is mimicking the substance ghrelin and your body's treating it as if it is ghrelin. So it's as if you have more ghrelin in your body. So if a gastroparesis patient takes TZP-101, their body's going to respond as if they just have more ghrelin in their bodies, increasing appetite and stimulating gastric emptying. However, we also have to look at does this hormone require a vagus nerve to be intact in order for it to fully work? Luckily, the answer seems like no, it does not require an intact vagus nerve because studies have found that patients with gastroparesis who took TZP-101 actually found improvements in their symptoms. They were less nauseous, they could eat more, and they felt less pain. That means that using a ghrelin receptor agonist it seems like a pretty good bet for somebody with gastroparesis, and hopefully in the coming years, there'll be more application of this medication to really see if it works and hopefully help patients. The other hunger hormone is called motilin and it also increases your gastric emptying speed and it makes you hungry. Motilin is also released during fasting, specifically in the third stage of the migrating motor complex or the MMC. The MMC is defined by this distinct pattern of electromechanical activity in the stomach. And it's where after you've eaten and most of the food has been digested, sometimes there's a little bit of food that's left over in the stomach. So the stomach contracts to move whatever is left over into the small intestines. Now, the MMC is actually made up of four different stages. Um, and like I said, this process occurs in the third stage. And the third stage is overall characterized by this motilin release as well as these strong contractions. Many gastroparesis patients experience an impaired gastric phase three within the MMC, and so they're not experiencing that same modal and release or those contractions. So the most probable explanation for this is that the modalin cells are found mainly in the duodenum and the jejunum, which are further along in the digestive tract than the stomach. And when those cells that release modalin are blocked, by food, they're not going to be releasing motilin. So somebody with gastroparesis is going to be having food in their stomach for a longer period of time, and they're going to have this constant release of food going through the jejunum and the duodenum, oh, but only little bits of food, but it's still food, and it's still going to be blocking the release of motilin. It appears that motilin release is not controlled by the vagus nerve, which is pretty exciting when considering possible treatment options for somebody with gastroparesis since they don't have an intact vagus nerve. A couple of different studies have found that a truncal vagotomy nor a vagosympathetic nerve blockade had any effect on plasma motilin levels. It's important to note that this type of motilin is called exogenous motilin because it's sourced from outside the body, whereas the type of motilin that your body is producing is called endogenous motilin. And it's interesting because motilin peaks towards the end of gastric phase three, as opposed to the beginning, which suggests that the onset of release of motilin does not begin the contractions, but rather motilin is just another aspect of this phase. However, we see something different with exogenous motilin, which is the motilin that you're administered through an IV, and we see that it actually brings on these contractions. This is really exciting, and hopefully this type of medication can start to be used for somebody with gastroparesis since we've seen its success. It does not need an intact vagus nerve, and it really brings on this gastric phase three that doesn't really happen in somebody with gastroparesis. If you're wondering where I'm at today with my gastroparesis, I still technically have gastroparesis and I definitely go into flares, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. I do, however, wish that when I was really struggling with my gastroparesis that I had better treatment options to help me. And I really didn't have many and there's not that many out there. So hopefully using these hormones as a basis for new medications can really help a lot of patients.